Holy crap, there's a lot to go over today, starting with all the latest news coming out of Intel's Computex event and how they're manipulating the data, Ryzen 9000 gets its first benchmark, and RX 8000 is dead on arrival? Welcome everyone to Gamer Meld. Okay, it's news time and first up for today, I'm going to quickly go over Intel's next-gen XE2 GPU architecture. For those who don't know, XE2, well, it's their Battle Mage GPUs. Well, it technically goes from their integrated GPU and mobile processors all the way up to discrete desktop parts. And yes, they are going to be releasing discrete Battle Mage GPUs, but unfortunately we don't really have too much information on that. This is really just an overview of the architecture itself. Either way, starting things off, they have a new ray tracing core, and this comes with three traversal pipelines, 18 box intersections, and two triangle intersections. But not only that, they also have a new XE core, just their main core, and here they go from SIMD 8 to 16. And this is a really big boost. It should make it more compatible with more games, should make it faster in more games. This is honestly a really big deal. I'm sort of getting through this quickly just because there's a lot to cover here, like I said. But moving on, there is a new render slice as well. Basically, this is a very big change, and thanks to that, they have some very big improvements here. As you can see, the IP performance efficiency, we are talking massive. Some of this has to do with ray tracing, some of this has to do with some other stuff. You can see mesh shader dispatch, we're talking at 4.1 times performance increase, then draw 11, 12.5 times, compute dispatch, seven times, trace rays 1.6 times, ray triangles 2.1 times. This is a massive boost and it all accumulates in a very nice performance uplift in Lunar Lake. So keep in mind that this is purely Meteor Lake H versus Lunar Lake. And don't forget that Meteor Lake already had a very nice integrated GPU performance uplift. Now we're moving 1.5 times faster than that for a 50% increase here. As you can see at the same ISO power, we are talking 1.5 times the performance, but it's not just more performance at the same power, it's also quite a bit less power draw for the same performance. Basically, XE2 is looking like a very nice improvement over last gen. And if you want to learn how all this awesome PC hardware I talk about actually works, there's only one place I recommend, and that's with today's sponsor. Brilliant, the tool that I use anytime I want to pick up something new on computer science, like their new course on large language models, the tech that powers all your favorite AI chatbots. And with AI set to take over before long, you definitely want to know how they tick. But there's other courses, like their course on how technology works, where they take you inside how computer memory works, GPS, video compression, and more. But it's not even what they teach you, but how they teach you. Because with Brilliant, you learn by doing. And today, when you visit brilliant.org slash gamermeld or use the QR code, you'll get a 30-day free trial. And when that's up, you'll get 20% off your premium membership for life. Once again, that's brilliant.org slash gamermeld or use the QR code. And next up for today, Intel unveiled Lunar Lake. And this one is one that I'm really going to be going over quite a bit here, and that's for a couple reasons. First, because Lunar Lake is a massive departure from pretty much anything Intel's ever done before. I mean, we're talking a giant architectural change, new PNE cores. We're talking this is such a big difference that it literally has on-package memory, meaning that if you purchase a notebook with this CPU in it, you won't be able to extend the memory. Now, they are going to allow that in Arrow Lake, and that is actually the same Second reason is the fact that the performance cores and efficiency cores in Lunar Lake are said to also come in Arrow Lake, which means the performance that we see with this is something that we can actually expect from next-gen Arrow Lake. So this is going to tell us quite a bit here, so let's get right to it. Starting things off, as you can see, AI performance about what we expected, 1.4 times. Then we have GFX performance, 1.5 times versus previous gen. Then things start getting a little weird. As you can see, it says core performance faster versus Ryzen 7 8840U and Snapdragon X Elite. Now, why is it that over here it gives us an actual percentage change while over here it just says faster? Well, 
Let's go down here. It's three. Okay, three. Intel, based on performance estimate with measurements on Lunar Lake against Ryzen 7 8840U and Snapdragon X Elite. Huh. So is this faster in just one core? Is it P core or E core? How much faster? Nobody knows. This would actually be pretty impressive if it was just their CPU Lunar Lake versus the 8840U just because the 8840U has eight cores and 16 threads while Lunar Lake's CPU is eight cores and eight threads. Yeah, no hyper threading. I'll get to that in just a second as well, but that would be pretty impressive because on their desktop line lately, Intel has had more cores than AMD. So if an eight core to eight core, the Intel CPU can actually be faster. That would be pretty impressive, but it doesn't really say here for sure. Still though, let's go back to hyper threading. Like I said, hyper threading is now done, but like I recently covered, this isn't just that they're just done with hyper threading and that's it. I mean, they are, but they're replacing it with something new. And I'm more or less went over this already within Intel's patent, but basically they end up using their E cores to sort of fill the gap where hyper threading isn't. But one thing you'll notice here, they talk about this, this is basically a scenario comparing a regular P core with hyper threading off with their current efficiency optimized P core that doesn't even have hyper threading. You can see it does significantly better, but even when you turn hyper threading on, their new P core is actually 5% faster performance per watt, but it loses 15% performance per area. But then whenever you include those E cores in there, oh, it gets 15% more performance per watt per area. Now, you'll notice that this is not just comparing performance. This is performance per watt, performance per area. So while they do seem to state in other places that they actually do better than versus the same kind of thing with hyper threading, the fact that they don't actually give us those numbers makes me sort of doubt that. Regardless, when it comes to performance, on IPC, as you can see, these new cores get a 14% performance increase. And while that ordinarily would be really impressive with the fact that they're doing such an architectural overhaul just for 14%, it doesn't really seem all that worth it, but it's actually much worse because as you'll notice, this is comparing it to Redwood Cove. And for those who don't know, Redwood Cove is the P core in Meteor Lake. But if this is still accurate, Meteor Lake CPUs are actually slower in single core performance when compared to Raptor Lake. So this 14% performance increase is actually less than that when you compare it to Raptor Lake, but it's even worse. Oh, really quickly, you can see here, they actually took a 14,600K, they brought it down to 4.8 gigahertz so they could compare it to the Core Ultra 7 155H. And as you'll notice in most of this, it does worse, but it gets even worse, worse, because as you can see here, the clock speeds aren't finalized yet, but they're expecting them to be at 5.5 gigahertz or similar range for Arrow Lake, meaning there would also potentially be a clock regression as well, meaning this 14% IPC increase is not looking all that great at all, just because we're talking a regression in clocks. This does not account for that, so it'd be even lower. Then it's also comparing it to Redwood Cove, which is apparently worse than Raptor Lake, so it's even lower there. Then when we look at performance at power, you'll also notice that plus or minus 10% margin. Well, it doesn't stop there because there isn't just P cores in next gen. There's also the E core SkyMon. And when we look here, it looks unbelievably impressive because we're talking 1.38 times and 1.68 times. So 1.38, so 38% faster in single threaded integer and then 68% faster in single threaded floating point performance. But when you get down here, you'll notice that that's versus Meteor Lake's LPE core. Now, for those who don't know, Meteor Lake comes with two different kinds of E cores. And as you can see right here in Tom's hardware, they state that the LPE core only has two megabytes of cache compared to the four megabytes of cache that's on the regular E core cluster. So they're intentionally only comparing it to the LP E core, but it's actually even worse than that because when we go over here, you can see that the LP E core is made from TSMC's N6 node while the regular E cores are built on the Intel four node, meaning that these 
right here, they are literally comparing it to a worse node than they really should be, and they're comparing it to one that has less cash, but it gets even worse when we move over here to multi-threading. Oh, four times performance, though at the same time, they're literally comparing it with way more power draw, and for those who may not know, this architecture, Lunar Lake, is specifically meant to be an ultra low power architecture, and yet they're doing that, but not just that, you'll notice it's SkyMont E-Cluster versus LP E-Core Cluster. Well, the LP E-Core Cluster is a dual core cluster, while SkyMont is a quad core, and the regular E-Cores on Meteor Lake are quad cores. So they're intentionally comparing it to the dual core as a quad core when they could be comparing it also to a quad core which is why you're getting this massive four times performance all oh, 2.9 times performance this is just crap with that said i will at least say that they do compare skymont to raptor cove which is raptor lake's p core and that's pretty impressive the fact that it can actually get right around to it but don't forget that this is ipc so they aren't allowing raptor cove to get to its highest clock so i mean obviously it is ultimately faster. This is just instructions per clock. This is just instructions per clock. So it, this is a fixed frequency. So basically the frequencies are the same, but once again, you have plus or minus 10% margin of error. And in fact, when we go here, plus or minus 10% margin of error, plus or minus 10% margin of error. Basically, there are a lot of issues with these benchmarks. So when you hear people say, oh, it's this much faster, eh, not really. Basically, this is not looking all that great for Intel, in my opinion. I mean, this is very impressive. But at the same time, they're doing so much really not cool stuff to get to these numbers. And next up, while speaking performance, we have one of the first benchmarks of AMD's Ryzen 9000 CPUs. As you can see right here, this originally comes from Tech Power Up, and it's of the Ryzen 9 9900X. And this actually comes from AMD's Computex event. This is just them going to their booths and things like that and filming things. And they apparently did a benchmark in Avatar Frontiers of Pandora. And as you can see, it got an average FPS of 229 with the 7900 XDX, and this is at 1080p graphics preset high. Well, when we compare this to, the thing about this is that it does sort of depend on a couple things. We don't really know if it has FSR 3 and what kind of settings it has, quality, performance, ultra performance, but I will say that here we have a preset of actually medium, not even a high preset, but just medium, and then FSR 3 quality with a 13,900K, 7900 XTX, it just got 171.1. So if it's anything like this, that's a pretty massive boost in performance there, though I do have to caution, some people did it with, I believe it was FSR3 Ultra Performance, and it was actually fairly similar with the 13,900K, but I will say that I highly doubt they used FSR3 Ultra Performance, but I don't know for sure, but obviously it should be significantly faster than the 13,900K, but yeah, this still, at least from what we're seeing here, doesn't look bad at all. And lastly for today, if you've been following the channel, and of course, if you haven't, make sure you subscribe and hit that bell icon for all the latest PC hardware news. But if you have, you know that I've talked about RDNA 4, which should be the architecture in AMD's next-gen RX 8000 GPUs. And what you know about that is that, at least from all the leaks that we've seen, it seems very clear at this point that AMD has more or less canceled their higher-end RDNA 4 GPUs, meaning they only plan to challenge NVIDIA in the mid-range. Well, it now looks like RDNA 4 isn't coming until next year, at least according to Hassan from WCCF Tech, who is likely at Computex. So this is almost certainly coming from people discussing this at Computex. And I will say, given the fact that we didn't really hear anything about it there, it very well may be true. And I guess what I'd asked about that is, does that mean that RDNA 4 is dead on a rifle? I mean, we pretty well know that the RTX 5000 series is set for release this year. And given the fact that AMD isn't planning to compete in the high end, 
and they're also waiting until next year. Maybe they're waiting for the 5070 series to see how they can compete price to performance, things like that. But if they're looking at it like that, it definitely doesn't sound good. So while that does it for today, do you think AMD's next-gen GPUs are dead on arrival? Let me know down in the comments below. And don't forget to try out Brilliant for free at brilliant.org slash gamermeld. And as always, have a great day.